You know, there's such a sweet presence of the Lord here already. You know, um, the preaching's uh, just the icing on the cake because the uh, Holy Spirit's already here. And we can come to this altar and get touched right now. Amen. So that's what the Bible says to come expecting. That's why I was trying to get you guys pumped up when we first got here because if you don't come expected, nothing will happen, right? So we got to come expecting that God's going to move and that God wants to move. Amen. He has something special in store for each one of us here tonight. We got to be open to receive. Amen. You know, the Bible says, uh, says in Ephesians 2, 8, For by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is a gift from God, not of works, then, amen, amen. So there's nothing we can do to get saved, but it's a gift from God. So we understand that uh, a gift is something that someone gives, amen. The Bible says that, uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Amen. So we understand that gifts are free and that in this world uh, things have a monetary value. So the Bible I have sitting over there was a gift someone gave to me. But if I went out and bought it, I know they probably cost about 40, 50 bucks, something like that. But uh, somebody gave it to me from their heart. It was a gift, right? So the Bible says, for by grace we are saved. It is a gift from God, gift of God. Um, amen. So, so we understand that it comes from God through faith. Amen. So, um, I want you guys to understand that, uh, uh, it's free, right? All you have to do is receive. So if we come expecting tonight, it's all free. You can't put a price on God. You can't put a price on the, the love he has for us. You can't put a price on what he has in store for us, all the blessings he has in our lifetime. Amen. We just got to be open to it. Amen. So I got some good news. I was able to save 15% of my insurance on Geico. Amen. <laughs> yeah, no, that's not, <laughs> that's not exactly true. What is true is about a month ago, I, I was, uh, the insurance I've had for three years was due, right? It was coming due. They sent me a little notice on uh, email me a little notice saying that it's going to be up in a month, and uh, and here's my quote for the next six months. And I looked at the price, and I'm like thinking, all right, I've been with you guys for three years, and I haven't had any tickets, no accidents, nothing. So I'm thinking that the prices should go down, right? But they didn't. They went up like $17 a month, and I'm thinking, that's crazy. So I called them up, and I asked them, well, what's the deal here? And they're like, give me a spill about how the insurance has gone up on everybody around the country, right? You know, I said, well, that's not exactly fair because I've been a good, faithful customer all this time, haven't got any tickets. But they, they said that's the way it is. That those are the rates we offered, and so take it or leave it, you know. So I said, well, you know, I've been uh, married for the last year and a half, and I haven't added my wife to the insurance. I know it costs less if you have your spouse on the insurance with you. They're like, yeah, that's true. So I went in and added my wife on there. And they sent me another quote. You know how much she saved? Two dollars a month. <laughs> so, so I was uh, still up fifteen dollars in the in for the month. And I was like, well, that's not right. So I started shopping around, you know. And I found insurance that I actually got double the coverage for half the price. Amen. So I can be excited about that. But I was thinking about uh, insurances like uh, the different religions around the world, you know. And there's uh, Tons to choose from, hundreds, if you will. And you can pick and choose, and you can buy into the different religions. You can buy into the different insurances. But it's up to you to investigate what you're actually buying into, right? So God wants a relationship with you. So it's not a, it's not a religion. He wants a relationship. So if he were to give us something, he, he doesn't put a price on it. That's the whole point I'm trying to get at. He says it's free. Here's my love. It's free. So we don't have to make installment payments like we do on insurance. Jesus paid the price full once and for all in the name of Jesus. Amen. <laughs> By his blood. He paid the price once and for all for each one of us. And all we have to do is be open to that love. Amen. So tonight we have the blessing of uh, Bishop Moody here tonight. Amen. <laughs> He's a... Uh, He's going to be the icing on the cake, if you will, and bring the word. Amen. <laughs> so, but uh, before we go, I know the praise and worship team just sat down, but uh, can
Can I get you guys to come back up here? <laughs> Amen. We're going to move quickly because I'm going to have Pastor Ramon come up and share from his heart a little bit about Mexico, and then we're going to take up the offering and get right into the Word of God. Amen. So, uh, Pastor Ramon, want to come on up? Amen. Amen. Gloria a Dios. Aleluya. Dios es grande. Dios es poderoso. Amen. That means that God is good. Don't get scared. Don't get scared. Don't get scared. Oh, man, I'm going to uh, hablando no lenguas, hallelujah. No, man, it's just been a, <laughs> I, it was a, it's a blessing. Uh, we were up in uh, Nogales. I've been doing the, the, the turnaround. I've been doing that for three weeks. You point out, not me? Okay. I thought you were like. <laughs> I've been doing, I, I leave at four or three in the morning. And I come back at uh, 12 at midnight. We've been doing that for three weeks already, and it's, it's, it's rough. But you know what? I have a, the passion that I have for what's happening in Mexico. And my wife was there, and she left. She came Friday, and she's all broken up and stuff. And she's just, it's just hard, man, when your wife's away, away from a week, and she comes back, and, and she has to talk to me. I'm, it's about 11 o'clock at night, and she wants to talk and talk and talk <laughs> and talk. I'm, Bishop, you don't know what I'm talking about. But, <laughs> no. but what happened is it, it's so awesome, you know, but it's a relationship, and it's what God wants with us. There was a, a little boy there. He's, only, he's been there for about four or five days, and he's just he's stuck to, to gl like, glued to my wife, and he's been walking, and she has to come home. And, man, he, he just cried, and he, he's, he says, that is a, take me with you. So I want to go with you. Take me with you. She's like, I can't. I can't. She's crying. She's all falling apart. She's like, no. And she's, she calls one of her little, little boys. He's nine, he's nine years old. He's like, come get this kid because I got to go. So he, she goes and pulls him away, and, and she's ready to drive off. And she says, I better check. He had hooked on himself to, to the back. He was hiding on the back. I was like, oh, my gosh. You know, but that's the thing I love about Mexico. And you know what? We don't, we don't give them much, but, you know, we just love on these kids. We're getting ready to open up the, the, the Teen Dream Center. Uh, we're getting ready. We're going to put all the, the, the from 13 to 17. We got eight kids. They're excited. Uh, we got some bunk beds hooked up. We're, we're going to do this. This thing going to be awesome. We got uh, uh, the rooms all. We got doors on most of the rooms, huh? If you don't know what they have, these guys' kids didn't have doors. The windows were all broken. We're putting doors for the bathrooms. I mean, it seems like nothing, but it's something for over there. For what, somebody doesn't have nothing, it's something. We got to be grateful for what it's doing. And... Uh, we're getting ready to, Pastor Wall gave us the, the money to pour. We're going to put bleachers at, at, uh, at, the, at the Dream Center and our sanctuary. God is just moving. And I, you know what? I haven't had a job in 15 years. I haven't had a boss, but my boss, the almighty God, powerful, he's the one that's provided everything. And, and I challenge you. I challenge you. I, I challenge my boss against your boss. Who will outgive? Who will outbless you? You know, my boss, he covers all my bills. He does it, man. And I, you know, I tell you what, and I live by faith. I, I get to Mexico sometimes, and, and we don't even have money to come back home. And I just pray, and I says, God, you brought me here. You're going to have to get me back. 100% of the time, somebody calls me, Ramon, you know what? I just deposit $500 in your check, and I said, no, I can go home. Hallelujah. That's the way it works. That's the way it works. Don't be, don't be like, like they say in Mexico, don't be scared. Because if you're scared. You can't serve God. Don't be scared. You know, God loves you. But I encourage you, if you have an opportunity, when maybe one of these days I'll take Bishop Moody over there. So you can go check out the, what we're doing up there, Bishop. One of these days. No, I <laughs> You just send the money then. Just send the money. Oh, hallelujah. We'll take your money. But God. <laughs> you're, you're staying home. No, 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 no. You got to get. Right. Okay. Ushers, come forward. Come forward. This is getting good. Ushers, come forward. Okay. Don't, don't bring the bags. Bring buckets, please. Because it's getting good. Father. Wow, we just thank you. Let's, 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 let's just praise God. Father, we just come before you, Lord, and I just thank you, God. This is, this is a testimony, Lord, of, for those that want what, what, what I have, Lord. That it takes a lot of giving and giving and giving, Lord. And then God puts out on you. Even more than you can imagine, God, and you've never let me down. I pray, Lord, today is that these men and women are challenged today, Lord, to, to give above what they thought they were going to bring. Just right now, Lord, that you say, man, I was going to give 10. I'm going to give 15. 
The other guy that brought 100 is going to give 120. Why? Because, God, you're, you're bless, I'll bless us, God. And I just pray right now because this finances, Lord, what Pastor Walt has done, Lord, is just to give back to, the, to his kids, to his, his spiritual children, Lord, and he wants to bless them. He wants to see them succeed. And I just thank you right now. Father, I just give you all the glory and all the honor and all the praise is yours, Father. And I thank you and all the men and the women of God said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Well, we got a guest speaker tonight. And, uh, you know, Bishop Moody, I don't think I've ever shared this with you, but uh, we have one of the same mentors in our lifetime. And uh, I gave my heart to the Lord when I was 21 years old at uh, East High School. Phoenix First was still being built up there. And so they were over at East High School. And uh, the person that led me to the Lord was Pastor Larry Karichuk. Amen. And then uh, that year was the year he started Master's Commission. And I joined the following year. And so that whole year, he uh, personally discipled me, right? And I know he invested time in you. So uh, I'm just saying how the Lord works, you know, brings people in your lifetime, in your path that you can uh, uh, glean from, you know. And, uh, and I believe that the Lord has a purpose each and every day, a reason why people come into your life. And you need to be open to that, that process. You need to be open to receive. Uh, God has something for each one of us. And I believe that tonight... Bishop Moody has a word from God, and, and we need to be open to that. So with uh, no further ado, here's Bishop Moody. Amen. Thank you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You can, if you want to just remain standing for a moment, we'll get our Bibles and read the word of God publicly. But before I do, I need those glasses because, uh, and now let the blind say I can see. Is that worship team coming back up in a, after I get done preaching? Oh, man. I don't know what you're going to sing when you get back, but set a fire down in my soul. That's just a little subliminal message. That's, that's what my wife does before her birthday. She says, I don't know what you getting for my birthday, but you know that. Look at that commercial about those diamonds. You know, you just like, what's? <laughs> she don't, though. Also, Pastor, our church wanted to give $5,222 to the ministry tonight. <laughs> Tell Pastor Walt we love him. It's, it's, not a, it's not a lot, but it's what God told us to give. And Pastor Larry Kircher, keep him in prayer. He called me a day before yesterday. He just spent uh, 10 days in the hospital. He almost died of an upper respiratory infection. He's uh, 67. About a couple years ago, he had a tumor on his brain, and God healed him of that. And now God just brought him off his deathbed. And he started a church in his home and, and has a five-acre home out in Care, uh, Cave Creek or Carefree. And he's starting services again in April. I'll be speaking out there. But I want you to keep him in prayer. Uh, you know, when he called me, it was just... You could see that God was really, he'd been humbled, and he's really seeking the Lord, and he used to live with my wife and I in the executive towers, and I was uh, best man at his wedding, and he was the one who married, did the officiated the service between my wife and I, so yeah, we've been together for, I got saved May 25th, 89 at his conference on his watch, and so uh, we are very thankful uh, for, for Pastor Kerchuk. First Kings chapter 19 and verses 19 through 21, we had our 12-year anniversary this morning at our Chandler Church, Gospel for Life, Pastor Bishop Tyrone Stowe now, and uh, I shared part of this, and then today at 4 o'clock, I shared at Redeemed International and Arrowhead, and shared an excerpt from this, and now I want to share an excerpt again, however God wants to do it. You know, you give that water to a prophet, you get a prophet's reward, you know that, don't you? Should I say that in Spanish, because you act like you just disrespected me there, I don't know what you want Gracias a Dios, Gloria a Dios, ese, you know that, vato, I know just enough Spanish to get in a fight, you know what I mean, I, don't, I get words wrong, I thought I was saying something nice, I was cussing, you know what I mean, I don't know, so, so I just steer clear of that, 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 19, it says, Elisha follows Elijah, if you're there, would you say amen? And it says in verse 19 through 21 in the New King James Version, 
If you're reading from the NIV, a nearly infallible version, then just stay with us. So he departed from there and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, I don't hear nobody, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him. And he was with the 12th. Then Elijah passed by him and threw his mantle on him. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, please let me kiss my father, my mother, and then I will follow you. And he said to him, go back again, for what have I done to you? So Elisha turned back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slaughtered them and boiled their flesh using the oxen's equipment and gave it to the people and they ate. Then he arose and followed Elijah and became his servant. That last sentence, would you read it again with me? Then he arose and followed Elijah and became his servant. Look at your neighbor and say, then he arose and followed Elijah and became his servant. Now tell two people, praise God, and let's be seated in the house of God. You may be seated. One of the common fatal mistakes that we see in the body of Christ, especially in preaching, is, is that we see a text like this, and when you have a text, it must be in context. And text that's out of context is error. And no prophecy of Scripture is private origin. When you have a passage of Scripture that becomes illumination to you, it is interpreted by the whole Bible. You don't take one passage of Scripture and then make the whole Bible bow to it. You take a passage of Scripture and you make sure it's rightly divided by taking all of Scripture, which is given by inspiration of God, and making sure that you have the ways and the rightly divided truth when you have a passage of Scripture. And there are rules in Greek and there's rules in Hebrew as far as picture language and Greek, Granville Sharp rules, aorist tense. There's these things that come into play that let us know that we've rightly divided the word of truth. And so when you read a text in a passage like this, you read what's before it and after it to find out what it's saying. When you go to chapter 20 and it says that Ahab defeats the, Assyri the Syrians, you realize that the Bible skips cadence there and it goes on to another story. And we don't need to read that story to be textually right when it comes to verses 19 through 21. But we realize we must read what's before it in order to rightly divide it and apply it in our life. In chapter 19 and verse 1 and 1 through 11, 10, it deals with Elijah escapes from Jezebel. Would you tell your neighbor, Elijah escapes from Jezebel? When we see verses 11 through 18, we see that God gives a revelation to Elijah. Say, God gives a revelation to Elijah. And we see that when you have Something in that we read in the New Testament, if you see it in the Old Testament, the Old has the New concealed in it, and the New has the Old revealed out of it. And if you read it in the New Testament, you should find it in the Old. And if you read it in the Old, you should find it in the New. And you'll find it in the New revealed. But if you can't find it in both, past, in both Old and New Testament, you shouldn't believe it. But it's not because it's not there. It's just that you haven't looked hard enough for it. Now... When we go to this text where Elisha is starting to follow Elijah, we must understand that there's a reason why uh, Elijah picks Elisha. And God has ordained this where to appoint someone means just to take someone and make them something. I said when you appoint someone or you commission someone or ordain someone, you're taking someone and you're making them into something. When the apostles and the disciples came, God picked those 12, Jesus did, and he took some some ones and he made them some some things. And so when we see here Elisha's getting ready to follow Elijah, we must see before us that the before Elijah can get a revelation to pick Elisha, he must first escape Jezebel. And you must realize that Jezebel is alive and well today. Jezebel is in the White House. Jezebel is in the church house. Jezebel is in the crack house. Jezebel is in some of y'all's house. And even though she is an Old Testament figure and she is female, you will never see her again if you're a born-again Christian because she's female and she went straight to hell. And you can't even find her physical remains. You can't find her bones because it says the dogs digested her, ran that, assimilated her through their digestive tract, and they crapped her out the back end. So if you want to find her, she's fertilizer somewhere in Israel. And the dogs, the DOGs, the disciples of God, why you want to DOG me out? 
See, that's what she was singing. Why you want to dog me out? Well, they dogged her out. And everybody who she emasculated, everybody who she took away their maleness, everybody who she made eunuchs were the ones that got to throw her off the wall. And Jehu got in his Holy Ghost wagon and he drove over her and then he backed up and then he drove over her again and then he got out and he started just doing it on top of her. See, most Christians today and pastors, they want to anoint her with oil and resurrect her and marry her and give her pulpit time and have her start running the church. But God says run the glory cart over her and then run it back over her because she's the one that's been taunting you. She's the one who's been punishing you. She's the one that put you in prison. She's the one who took your manhood. She's the one who's got your children. She's the one who made you gay. She's the... And even though that's a she in the Old Testament, and it's an Old Testament figure, she's alive and well today because she's not a person anymore. She's a spirit. She's a doctrine. She's an influence. She's a belief system, and she's a way of thinking in our lives today. And you can't escape her because she's in the White House. She's in the church house. She's in the crack house, and she's in some of our houses. And you're going to have to confront her and deal with her and make your call and election sure. And you're going to have to escape yourself from her and get free of her because there's 850 false prophets of Baal who speak her doctrine, who are on her payroll. And they're not going to change their doctrine because she pays their car allowance. She pays their housing allowance. She pays for their church fees. She gives them their credit card to go where they want to go. These are kept men who are kept by Jezebel. So they got to preach her doctrine because if they don't preach her doctrine, she will literally cut them off hmm but every time there's 850 false prophets of Baal who are on her payroll who eat at her table there always comes one along with camel hair turned inside out in the middle of the summer and he's eating bugs and he's chewing on bugs with honey he's he's dipping bugs in honey he must be part Mexican and he he's eating bugs with honey on him and he comes along, and he's got a different message, and it's not popular, and it doesn't go with the flow. He's got a message because, see, he don't care about no car. He doesn't care about no house. He doesn't care about no spouse. He just wants Jesus. He's in love with Jesus. He's in love with God's word, and he's not kept by Jezebel. He's kept by Jesus. His husband is Jesus. So we see that this is a figure. We see that this is a doctrine. We see that God says in Revelation he hates the doctrine of Jezebel that causes God's people to do spiritual immorality and spiritual idolatry. We're getting ready to have Resurrection Sunday. She's going to have a bunch of people hunting bunnies. Fertility gods. She's going to tell you that when you get a bunny with a bunny, she's going to convince you you get an egg. But when a bunny humps a bunny, you get a, you don't get an egg. Ah, I'll get off that. Because some of y'all already got your eggs in a boiler and you're getting ready to paint. I'm going to go ahead and get off that for a minute. I just want to know who's got you doing the painting. And isn't it interesting she's got you dealing with eggs? In, 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 in Spanish, we call those huevos, you know what I mean? I didn't cuss. So Elijah has to escape Jezebel. And unless you escape Jezebel, and unless you come out from under her influence, you'll never understand what the true voice is. You're going to keep following earthquakes. You're going to keep trying to follow conferences where there's a strong wind. Because you need wind. You need earthquakes. You need fire to believe God. But you know that you can go through the wind, the earthquake, and the fire. But when it's all said and done, God's going to get you in a steel place, and he's going to sit you down, and you're going to hear a still, small voice, a delicate, whispering voice. And he's going to say, Elijah, what are you doing here? See, God's deeper than all that. And when he calls Elisha into the ministry, Elijah, he puts a mantle on him. And when he puts the mantle on him, he just says, I've elected you and selected you. You're my divine selection and my divine election. I'm putting my mantle on you, which is a symbol of my authority and my office. And if you're here when the mantle drops, you're going to get that office and that authority. See, some people say, well, you're chasing a man. Ain't nothing wrong with chasing a man if you're trying to get to the mantle. Because, see, everything you have, you received. 
If you have life in here today, that came from the loins of your father. He's the one that gave you life. If you were birthed out into this thing, your mother birthed you out. If you've grown now, somebody fed you. If you got something from the word of God, there's nothing you have that you didn't receive, so why are you boasting like you thought it up? Think about anything you have today, good, bad, or ugly, you received it. Whether it be the world, the flesh, the devil, or God himself, there's nothing you have you didn't receive, even your pride. And he throws this mantle on Elisha, which really what he does is he ruins his life, his old life. His old way of thinking, his old way of stinking thinking, his old way of doing things. He is plowing. He's been plowing for 12 years. He's doing fine. He's plowing. He's working. He's flipping hamburgers. He's doing what he does. He may have a woman. He's got his life going on. And how many of you know you were just minding your own business and God came on? And he picked you. He chose you. You said you chose him, but the truth is you tried everything else, and he made circumstances over circumstances. Some of you had to go back to jail a second time. Some of you had to go back to prison a third time because he didn't have your full-blown attention in round one and round two. And he wants to know now, is there five bars on the cell phone? He's asking, Elijah, what are you doing? Can you hear me now? (laughs) How many know God will ask you, can you hear me now? Tell your neighbor, can you hear God now? You ever notice when you were kids and your parents started to discipline you? You know, your dad would come out and he would give you the first whack. And it wasn't quite strong enough yet. And you'd say, don't hit me, dad. I didn't do nothing. Now, he knew the devil's a liar, so he hit you again. Bam! Yeah, I, I hit sis in the head. I'm sorry, dad. Bam! Yeah, I tore her Barbie doll head off. Bam! Yeah, I sold the TV for dope. What? Bam, 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 bam. <laughs> Truth just starts coming out. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall cut or make you free. For whom the sun sets free is free indeed. And when truth comes, how many know sometimes it hurts like hell? Hmm. Hmm. And he realizes, wait a minute, I've been divine selected, and I've been divine selected. I'm just minding my own business. And all of a sudden, this mantle came on me. I got saved. I didn't know how I got saved. I didn't know no doctrine. I didn't know the word Bible wasn't in the Bible. I didn't know the word Trinity was in the Bible. All I know is I was lost, and I went into a hotel room, and a man said, Jesus will love you and be a friend that sticks close to the brother. The brother, the Holy Spirit, picked me up, took me to the altar. A man laid hands on me. I was slain in the Holy Ghost. I came up from being in the mob just saying, I love Jesus. And if somebody asked me, who is Jesus? I say, I don't know, but I love him. Where are you going from here? I don't know, but I love Jesus. I'm saved. God is good. My language changed. What I thought changed. I just knew that I knew Jesus. I couldn't have told you who he was, if he was God, if he was a rat. I couldn't have told you anything about his person. All I knew is I love Jesus now. I went in one way, and I came out another way. I had to go to the church to get goofed up. See, after you get saved, you got to go to the church to get goofed up. You usually got it right till you go to the church, and then man starts cutting on you. And I tell you what, and then you get saved, and then you go into the church, and you know you, you saved, but you just ain't quite sanctified. And you go in the church, and you're like, wow, this is a weird group of people. Is this a cult? Because <laughs> you saved, you love Jesus, you know they do, but you're like, man, this is a weird group. Because you saved, but you just ain't quite sanctified yet. Remember that? You went to the church, you was happy and go lucky, and then you started seeing folk, and you're like, wow. That's a crazy cat over there in third corner. Amen corner is crazy over there. Weird people. So about six months go by, you got the Holy Ghost, but all of a sudden you'd be thinking, they're crazy over here. So I think maybe God's wanting me to go back and be a witness in a topless bar or something. I don't know. Maybe I'm supposed to go back to the clubs, you know. So, you know, you were supposed to destroy everything, you know, and get rid of all that worldly stuff, but there was still some stuff you got rid of, but then there was a stash back here that you didn't know you hadn't got sanctified yet. So you, you still got some white pump boots, you know what I mean? You still got some parachute pants. You still got a trench coat. There's still a couple rings you can put back on, you know what I mean? So here you are sanctified. You dress up like the world, you know what I mean? You head to the club. You go into the club. You know, the stuff that used to attract stuff. All of a sudden, the same woman that used to come up to you now, all of a sudden... 
they stop and walk around you. <laughs> this is what happened to me. I said, I can't go in the church. They're weird. Now the world doesn't accept me. I went in the bathroom, same bathroom I always went into at Zazu at the club. Went into the bathroom, commode started flushing. All of a sudden they said, five O's in here. I said, I ain't five O. I couldn't go in the church, they were crazy. I couldn't go back to the world and they wouldn't accept me. I was torn between two lovers, feeling like a fool because loving both of you was breaking all the rules. <laughs> and you ever done that? You saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, got tongues, and all of a sudden you tried to take a step back, get back in Egypt, and thought you could mix it up in Egypt, and the stuff that used to satisfy you, the stuff that used to give you zeal, the stuff that when you did it, you couldn't wait to do it again, you do it once, all of a sudden you feel filthy. I never felt filthy before, God, what's going on here? You done ruined my life. Where's Elijah? I want to kill Elijah. What the heck happened to me? I just ran up and said, I love Jesus. I accept Jesus. Now sin ain't good no more. Hmm. Hmm. Some of you saying you saved, you ain't experienced that. I'm telling you, you didn't get saved. You need to get born again again. You didn't get it. If sin's still good to you, you didn't get it. Because see, before, you didn't even care. You just go from one hole to another hole. You didn't even shower. Now, all of a sudden... Now, all of a sudden, you just dabble fall once, you in a hot scolding shower crying, God, get it off of me, get it off of me, get it off of me. Hot scolding water, blistering, you just like a rat, ah, I'm nasty. Just put on skivvies and go lay out in the sun, almost naked and read the book of Romans. Cleanse me, Jesus, 110 degree weather. Laying out in the sun for eight hours. Just took a four-hour shower. <laughs> Cleanse me, God. What happened? But until Elijah escaped Jezebel, he could not get a true revelation from God in this. And I want to tell you, until you come out of the grips of Jezebel and come out of the portals of her loins, until you get out from underneath her doctrine and renounce her ways, you do not have a true revelation of God. You are just parakeeting what all the false prophets are saying. Because her doctrine will cater to your flesh. And influence always wins out over authority. Some of you ladies in here, I'm, I'm submitted to my husband's authority. If you don't help him dominate you, you're going to run crazy. My husband wants to do this. Yeah, with all them subliminal message, what you think he was going to do? He thinks he chose that. He don't know you set him up. Come on, ladies. Influence always wins out on authority. I'm telling you, my two sons, if my mother and my wife don't help me get them to heaven, they're going straight to hell because they have the influence, I have the authority, they're going to win. And if you men think you're superior to women, you just go in and watch them have a baby. About five minutes into that thing, you're going to be throwing up and running like a girl out of the room. Ah! Ah! What is that? How to stretch like that? You vomited. Mr. Man of God. But after Elijah escapes Jezebel, it's then that he gets a revelation from God, and he goes through the strong wind, the earthquake, and he goes through the fire, and finally he gets the delicate, whispering, still, small voice. And he says, uh, I'm going to give you orders from headquarters. Look at Elijah, what he's saying to God. It says in verse 13, so it was when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in a mantle and he went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. Suddenly a voice came to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? Now, the first thing Elijah does is the same thing we do when we've really been serving God. We give him a Catholic confession. Listen to this. And he said, I've been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts. Because the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with a sword, I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. You ever felt like that? I'm the only one serving God. I'm the only one saved. He ain't saved. 
There's sin in his life. He ain't giving it up for the Lord. You ain't giving it up for the Lord. I'm the only one on planet Earth giving it up for the Lord. I'm alone. They seek to take my life because I'm it. Then the Lord said to him, see, God don't even answer that false piety and all that Catholic confession of how good you are. He just knows the law of the vacuum. He's going to put something in place of your self-pity. He says, look, I'm going to give you a vision. Where there's no vision, the people perish. Where there's no prophetic revelation, the people cast off restraints. Listen to Elijah. He says, then the Lord said to him, go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, anoint Haziel as king over, over Syria. That's your first assignment. Then he says, also you shall anoint Jehu, the son of Nimsha, king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat of Abel Mahola, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. And he says, it shall be that whoever escapes the sword of Hazel, Jehu will kill. Whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha will kill. Yet I have reserved 7,000 Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed her, Jezebel. See, you ain't alone. You ain't the only one serving God. You ain't the only one giving it up for God. You ain't the only one that feels like you're the only one that's zealous. There are 7,000 times 7,000 times 7,000 who are remnant Christians who are giving it up just like you're giving it up, how God's telling them to give it up. You are not alone, and those who are with you are more than those who are against you, and greater is he who's in you than he who is in the world. You're not alone. I think the worship leader said, you're not alone. God is able. God is able. That's a word for you tonight. He said the word was God is able. There's two words from the Lord tonight. You're not alone. God is able. God is able. Then here's the context. After Elijah escapes Jezebel, then he gets the revelation from God. What am I saying here? I'm saying that if you have a pseudo or false spiritual father that's under this doctrine, they cannot see clear to choose you to your call and your election. What's my proof text? Saul could not see the call of David. It took Samuel to come along, a true spiritual father, not regarding him according to the flesh, to say, bring all of your children out, Jesse. And they marched seven of them before him. And he said, nope, nope, no, 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 no. Is there not another? See, you're... Your spiritual father has Holy Ghost eyes. He doesn't regard you according to the flesh or compare you amongst others. He knows in the spirit, this isn't it. This isn't it. Is there another one on the back 40 who's serving? Go get him. I'll wait till he comes. See, your natural father can't see it. Your first spiritual father who is under that doctrine of Jezebel and under the pride and performance and all those things, they can't see the call on your life. It takes a true spiritual father to see the call of God on your life because he doesn't regard you according to the flesh. He don't care if you've been to prison once, twice, five times, ten times. He doesn't care if you've been a fornicator, adulterer, child molester. If God's calling you, he sees it in the spirit and he calls you forth in the name of Jesus. He don't want to hear your piety. He don't want to hear your confession. He don't want to hear about your history. He says, I'm here to tell you who you are right now and where you are going and who you are in Christ. And it takes a spiritual father to see that. Elijah could not see what he was supposed to do until he got free from Jezebel. He got a revelation from God, and then he knew these are orders from headquarters. I'm going to do what God said to do. And many of us are searching for a revelation from God, and God is not going to give you a further revelation from him until you start acting on the one he's already given you. And if you're not faithful over little, you'll never rule over much. And if you're not faithful in another man's ministry, you'll never have your own ministry. And if you're not under authority, you'll never be of true authority. And when Elijah decided to put the mantle on Elisha, it says that Elisha had to be there when the mantle dropped in order to receive the double portion. And the only way he could get that is if he was there when the mantle dropped. And here's how he got the mantle. Elijah threw the mantle on him. And when he did, he told Elisha, Elisha, I'm getting ready to have a conference, and I want you to come to my conference. And if you bring me 1995 to my conference and buy my book and my tape, I will blow on you. And instantly, you will have my mantle and you'll have my anointing, and you can go live happily ever after. I really don't know your name. I don't even know who your kids are. You can call me your spiritual father and send me money to my P.O. box. Now, see, in some churches, I get some amens on that, and they go, oh, yeah, that's how we do it. And you can get mad at the false men of God and all the false prophets on Christian television because they're asking you for that money. But how many of you know a pimp goes out of business if you don't have no hoes? 
See, as long as he's hoeing folk and they're sending money to him, it justifies his position and keeps him <laughs> swole up. As long as you allow him to keep <laughs> blowing on you and you think that that's the mantle. Because, see, when Elijah got served by Elisha, it wasn't a conference. It wasn't a blow by anointing. He couldn't buy it. a matter of fact, if you Simonize or try to buy the things of God, you're poisoned and you're bound with bitterness and iniquity, Peter said. It doesn't mean you don't honor the man of God and when you're taught, you pay the instructor because the labor is worth his wages. I'm talking about thinking you can buy an office or buy an anointing or buy a mantle. So it wasn't just a one-time deal or a conference or a hyper-faith preacher who conned you into sending the money and he's pimping out the body of Christ. This was a true spiritual father. Paul said you have 10,000 instructors but few fathers with paternal care who will come alongside and really father you. few of those but what he said is is it says he became his minister now listen when Elisha becomes a minister the first thing he does is he goes and he gets his oxen his implements everything that was his livelihood from his former life and he does an offering and he starts giving the stuff away see folks know you serious when you start giving your jewelry away here I won't be needing this oh hello here's that you like that necklace? That's cool. Here comes all the demons with it. What else would you like? <laughs> Stuff that was important to you, you just start chucking out. All your mob movies, gone. X-rated movies, gone. You throwing stuff in trash. You taking stuff to pawn shops. People, even if your parents don't believe you, they go, something changed. I don't know. I'm watching this. He says he's got Jesus. We'll see. We'll check it out. But they know that you're coming to have a farewell dinner. See, the problem is the farewell dinner is a one-time deal, but we keep going back three times a week having farewell dinners. We, we keep reporting back to the family reunion in the Quincinetta. And the Bible says if you hate not father, mother, son, daughter, brother, sister, yea, your own life and take up your cross, you're not even my disciple. You haven't even come to 101 Christianity. And so when Elisha gets the call, Elijah it says that he... He did all this stuff with his family, parted his ways, and it says, what does it say that we read to each other? That last verse, it says, then he arose and followed Elijah, and he became his servant. He arose. He broke ties with all that stuff. And he arose, and he followed Elijah, and he became his servant. Do you know how long until 2 Kings chapter 2 and chapter 2 and the verse verse when the mantle finally fell? Do you know how long? He followed Elijah and ministered to him before the mantle dropped and what he had by faith came to full fruition. It wasn't one conference. It wasn't a weekend at Bernie's. It wasn't attending church for a year. It wasn't phase one or phase two. It was 11 years. He was in phase 33. Oh, I'm graduating from phase two. Do you want to be like Elisha? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You're going to phase 33 in the year 2052. That's when Walt's mantle is going to drop. Do you still want to follow him? But you know, when Elisha gave that burn offering, he got rid of it and he cut all those ties. His family, he sang a song to him. They didn't know what it meant, but he went something like this. I have decided... To follow Jesus, I have decided to follow Jesus, I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. He looked right at his mom and dad, he said, though none go with me. Still I will follow. Love you, Mom. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Miss you, Primo. Though none go with me, still I will follow. I won't turn back. I won't turn back. I've decided to follow Jesus.
He became his servant and followed him. And before the mantle dropped, he followed him for 11 years. He became a minister to Elijah. And the word minister there, Sharat. If you look at its secular meaning, in the secular meaning, it means to have austerity or self-authority. That's what the world says it means if I'm the minister of defense for America. But the scriptural meaning and the spiritual meaning means yieldedness, servanthood, and obedience. And the Hebrew picture is one who takes water. And he takes the water and he pours it out on his hands. And he bends a knee. And when Elijah comes in from Mexico, he washes his feet. And then he sees, oh, you've been laying hands on some dirty folk. And he just washes his hands. He anoints his spiritual father with oil. Takes his shoes off and washes his feet. Then he goes over there and he rubs his feet down and puts some nice oil back on it and puts it back on him and he serves him and says, can I get you some water, dad? Can I get you something to eat? What is it you need? Because I know you're going back out and I'm here to serve you, not because I'm serving a man, but I'm waiting on a mantle. And when the mantle drops, I know it's your authority. I know it's your office and I know it's your call and I'm willing to wait no matter how long it takes because where you go, I go. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Where you die, I die. Where they bury you, they bury me. There's nothing but death going to part us because I'm going where you go. And when he followed him, it wasn't distant discipleship. When we think of following somebody, if I told you, get up here right here, go ahead and lead, and I told you to follow him, what would be your position? There you go. And he starts walking, and you go walking. But can I tell you, even though that's what we've learned, that's not scriptural. When you follow somebody, it's the picture of like a husband and wife, and you're over here, and you're right by his side, and he's of authority, so you're, he, you're under him, and you are connected at the hip, and when he takes a step, you take a step with him. And that's what it means to follow, to be in one accord and in synchronicity. See, you're going to learn something when you follow that way. And when, you, when Jesus called Matthew, he didn't call Matthew to follow from 10 feet and observe. He said, Matthew, come get connected to my hip. I'm going to show you a little something. And he said, when I step, you step. There's nothing I do that I don't see my Father in heaven doing. So if I'm submitted as God to my Father in heaven, and I'm God in the flesh, and I'm submitting to my Father, how much more should you submit to your Father, your spiritual Father? And see, some of you have linked to the, something that you called your spiritual Father, but it's not your spiritual Father. And when you connect to your spiritual father, you have no problem with obedience. You have no problem with servant. And you realize it's not going to be an easy road because you're going into servanthood. See, to be a slave is wrong when you're a slave to another man against your will because another man has made you a slave. But when your master is a good master, when your master is Jesus, and he calls you to be a slave of Christ, you can bet that you might be a slave for a minute, but it won't be long till he makes you a son. And after he makes you a son, then he's going to make you a friend. And you can actually really sing, I am a friend of God. See, too many people on this grace message, they get say, I am a friend of God. You ain't been a slave yet. You ain't been a son yet. You either pastored or you're bastard. And we need to figure out what you are before you become a friend of God. You know, Jesus, he's my brother, not till you serve. Jesus, he's my friend, not till you become a son. See, that old phony Jezebel message would tell you, just come to God any old way. You know, and it, it, don't, it doesn't matter. He's the big boy upstairs. You know what's going to happen when you call God the big boy upstairs, when you go get your award at MTV rap videos? He going to kill you. Oh, we just want to thank the big boy upstairs. Then a video, all I want to do is zoom, 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 zoom. Just pop me up. We just want to thank God for giving us. The, the devil gave you that award. God ain't in that. Stop even talking to him that way. Just say, hey, we want to thank the devil for this pornography. Oh, my God. Oh, we just, you know, we just, we always want to give the glory up to who? The principality, the power of the air, Satan in the first and second tier. Because if you're going to El Elyon, he ain't giving you no award for doing a 
pornographic rap video just because you grew up in a black or Mexican or white Baptist church. Because, see, you can sleep in a car, in a garage, but it don't make you a car. Well, my mom is a Christian. So, my grandmother was, God ain't got no grandkids. You either a son or a daughter, or you going to hell. You either for me or you against me. Choose. I want to thank the big boy upstairs for giving me an award for my pornographic rap video. You know they ain't got no daddy when they was named after something in the refrigerator. Iced tea. Soup bone. Pimp milk. Snoop. Dog. Oh, Snoop Lion. Oh, Snoop Cheetah. You don't know what, what's what you confused, brother. Vanilla Ice. Named after a cake icy. You know what I mean? Just because you know the devil will name you anything. And then after he names you that, he'll tattoo it on your head. Retard. He put it right on you. Don't worry, if you don't know who you are, the devil will name you. See, because they always tell you, oh, don't worry about you, what you've done. Jesus will take you back. And they think that there's this vacancy sign that keeps flashing in heaven. But I want to tell you, Revelation says there'll come a day where it says, let the just remain just and the unjust remain unjust. And there'll be a flashing light that says no vacancy. But hell burps and makes its borders bigger, it says in the Old Testament. It said there's room for you in hell. And, if, and you know what? Jesus may not always take you back, but the devil's a pimp. He'll take you back. The world's a pimp. She'll take you back. Jezebel's a hoe. She'll take you back. Trust me, the world, the flesh, and the devil, Orange, uh, Fourth Avenue Jail, uh, Towers, Estrella, they'll all, Florence, they'll take you back. God may not take you back, but the devil will take you back. Because there's a sign in hell that just says vacancy, vacancy, and it just keeps flashing. It says it can't get its, its fill. It just burps and gets its borders bigger because it wants more souls. Hmm. See, the prophets of Jezebel never preached that to you. They never told you that. They said, it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter what you say. It doesn't matter what you gave. Just as I am, Lord Jesus. Well, God is going to take you just as you are. And then with fire, chisel, and hammer, he's going to get to work on you, on you. From the inside out. You ain't got to worry about, well, I think I'm going to go help this brother and judge him. You don't have to worry about when someone's truly God's, when God puts his heavy hand on them, they'll be in a corner, mobsters in a corner crying like a girl, Jesus, please forgive me. God, your hand is heavy on me. No, nothing's happening. He's just in the corner. Ain't nobody touching him. This dude used to kill people. He's crying in the corner because God's hand is heavy. Anybody ever had God's hand heavy on you? You couldn't find the peace and God was trying to get your attention? And all of a sudden, remember, and then people come up threatening you. You know what? I mean, God's going to get you. He's already got me. When somebody says, God's going to get you, say, good, because he's already got me. I want him to get me some more. Says he chastens those he loves. I know he loves me because he's beating on me. I'm, I, I, I can't get away with a lust thought, and you're getting away with murder, so I know he loves me more than you. It looks that way, huh? Then he arose, and he followed Elijah, and he became his servant. Look at this, 2 Kings chapter 2 as we close. It's 730. Elijah ascends to heaven. Now, here it is. Tell your neighbor, whoop, there it is. Whoop, there it is. Whoop. There it is, chakalaka, chakalaka. <laughs> what are we doing? Hey, worship team, what are we doing? We coming? Now listen. Elijah's getting ready to ascend. He's getting ready to ascend to heaven. Elisha has followed 11 years. He knows 
he's past phase 33. And phase 34 is where the glory is at. And it came to pass when the Lord was about to take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. And Elijah said to Elisha, stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to Bethel. Listen, when you got saved, you got saved at Gilgal. Gilgal is an Old Testament word that means the wheel, like the wheel of life. It actually is a cognate word of the word Gilgatha or Golgotha, the place of the skull. And the enemy would love for you to just get saved tonight and stay in that position with Christ where you know you're saved, but you never walk on to Bethel. And God ain't trying to beg you. When Elijah called Elisha, Elisha said, I want to go tell my mom and dad bye. He said, what's it to me? Go do what you want to do. See, legalism will tell you, oh, you can't go do that. God wants you over here. And they start seeing if you're circumcised or not. They want to start cutting on you. Your hair's too long. You don't got a tie on. You do got a tie on. You wearing glasses. You, hair, you female, your hair's too short. You too skinny. You too Mexican. See, they, see the church folks, they crazy. They, just, they start cutting on you on the outside when God's trying to work on the inside. God ain't worried about your short or long hair. He'll sort that out down the road. He's worried about now your soul and your spirit. He'll get to that when he's ready to get to that. He's going to put his thumb on something you don't want him to touch that nobody else sees. See, integrity is what you do and don't do in the dark. God sees that. And a true spiritual father ain't going to beg you. You saved? You want to stay at Gilgal? Matter of fact, just stay here. I'm going on to Bethel, which means the house of God. I'm going to church. You, you, want, to go, you want to go to the lake? You want to go visit Aunt Jezebel, who's visiting from Vegas? You want to go to the Adams Family Reunion today at noon over at the park? You want to go to the Quinsonetta because your family be mad? You know, she turned 15 today. They'll kill you. If you don't go to the Quinsonetta, you ain't part of our family. One Kinsanata, you know, and you can blame who you want to, but every ethnicity, white, black, Mexican, you all have cultural curses, and you know if you don't show, if you choose Jesus, they're going to say, you think you're better than me? See, white folk would like you to believe they didn't got none of those traditions, but they do too. Oh, you going to church? I got, I got tickets to the Suns game. They only, you know, LeBron's only in town once a year. You know, Queen LeBron. See, Queen LeBron don't mean nothing when you're serving King Jesus. He, we can tape that game. And anyway, since he went to Miami, he's suspect anyway. I think he's been tampered with. See, he was a man in Cleveland. Now he's walking kind of crazy, you know. I don't know what he's doing. Shaq, too. See, when they start putting them in dresses and purses, you know, it's crazy. When a man starts dressing like a woman and getting a purse, the Bible says that's an abomination in the sight of God. And you know what? The devil don't care what color you are. <laughs> Jezebel just wants to make you gay and take away your manhood. Because see, what Jezebel does is she emasculates you. She takes away your manhood. It's a spirit. It's a doctrine. You say, well, it's a woman. It's gender friendly to a woman, but if a man's trying to get in touch with his feminine side, she'll come in you too. Hmm. Hmm. So a spiritual father's going to try to shake you. Stay at Gilgal, but I'm going to the house of God. Then Elijah said to Elijah, stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me to Bethel. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives and your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they, say they, they went down to the house of God. When your spiritual father's in the house of God, you're in the house of God, unless he's ordained you to be somewhere else. Now the sons of the prophets who were at Bethel came to Elisha and said to him, do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? Do you realize that someday Walt Retrayal will go on to be with the Lord? What will you do? Well, you'll do just what they did with Joshua. When it was time for Joshua to take over, God took Moses for a walk, put a cap in his head, 
and said, we're going this way, Moses. Joshua, take over. God ain't limited. And he says, then Elijah said to him, he said, and Elisha said, yes, I know someday my spiritual father will go on. He says, but let me tell you something. Don't try to scare me. Keep silent. You know what keep silent means in the Hebrew? Shut up. Stop trying to scare me out. I love Moses. I love Elijah. But Jesus is still God. And yes, they're going to go on to be with the Lord someday. But I'm surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Shut up about that. You're trying to scare me. Then Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here at church, please, for the Lord has sent me on to Jericho. Jericho is where we get the word Jeruacho. It's the Ruach. It's the wind and it's the spirit. It's when we get filled with the Holy Ghost. See, Gilgal, you get saved. How many know when you got saved, you went to the house of God? When you went to the house of God and you heard the preaching of the word of God, you were baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost. Now they arguing over, well, if you're saved and you don't have the Holy Ghost, it's like a second baseman and shortstop turning a double play. It's axiomatic. You get saved, you get baptized in water, you go to church. And at church, you get baptized in water. And after you get baptized in water sometime in there, you just get filled with the Holy Ghost. It's not some legalistic ritual things. One may come before the other, but you're going down that, you're going down that path. Oh, well, if you don't get it this day, brother. You know, God ain't bound by the last participle of the, participle of the Hebrew or the Greek. Did you get saved in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost or in the name of Jesus? How were you baptized? Man, get off it. I've baptized people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost and in the name of Jesus Christ. And that's, we covering all bases so you don't get tricked later. Because folks be trying to trick people. But he says he went to Gilgal, that place of the skull. He got saved. He went to Bethel, the house of God. Then he went on to Jericho. Then Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on. And, it, you know, I'm going deeper with this thing. I'm getting filled with the Holy Ghost. I'm going into the sanctification process. It may not be for you, Elisha. Just stay here. And he said, what did he say? He said, as the Lord lives and your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they, say they, came to Jericho. Now the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho came to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? Here they go again, trying to scare folks. Now you filled with the Holy Ghost. You out here on a limb. You swimming in deep waters now. And God's about to take your pastor home. What you going to do out there? You can't swim out there. You need floaties. Did you get your floaties on? See, we got too many Christians. They out in the deep end with floaties on. That don't count. You cheating. Get back in the shallow end. You belong in the splash pool. Or like we used to do where I grew up in Indiana. We were poor. You just need to slide in the grass and have your brother hose you down with water. That's how poor folk do it. You just steal a bunch of plastic from the neighbor and you put it out. And then you just run and slide head first and your brother just sprays you down with water. Look at that. Hallelujah. Shh. You. That's big surf for you. You just. <laughs> he said, I know that that's going to happen. Shut up. You got to tell the devil your flesh sometimes, shut up. You say, that's auto suggestion. That's like psychology or new age. No, David said, be at rest, oh my soul. Sometime when his flesh wants to reach out for the wrong time, you got to tell, these members are, are members of righteousness now not unrighteousness sometimes you gotta just tell the flesh flesh you better behave today you're gonna do the right thing you ain't gonna do the wrong what what'd you say people think you're crazy but you say why are you slapping your hand brother because i ain't going to hell bible says your hand caused you to stumble better that you cut your hand off and that you enter heaven maimed instead of enter hell whole now, don't y'all start pulling out knives because now all our legalistic brothers pull their old switchblade out. I knew God called me to be a cutter. Let me get your hand. You need your eyes gouged out too. Then Elijah said to him, stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to Jordan. See, Jordan is not what you cross over when you go to heaven. That's the lie of the enemy, and that's the lie of the traditional church. The Jordan means a place of spreading judgment. When you cross the Jordan, you cross into the life of faith. You cross into the promised land. It's where you meet all the ites. 
There's all kinds of ites up in there. Gergeshites, her, hermaphrodites, Berthashites, boo-boo shites, Canaanites, cocaineites, they all up in there. That can't be heaven because when you get to heaven, it ain't for war. When you get to heaven, it's a place of bliss. It ain't a place where, well, I'm glad I'm in heaven. And then you start fighting. So when you cross the Jordan, you're crossing into the life of faith, and God's word becomes your promised land, and all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him, amen, to the glory of God through us. And we start possessing what God gave us to possess. He says, stay saved, stay in the church, stay filled with the Holy Ghost, but don't enter the life of faith, and don't get your promises, and don't get your inheritance. And for God's sake, don't possess it, don't occupy it, don't train in it, don't maintain it, and don't reign in it. Stay over here. And just get a badge that you're saved, eternal security. Get a badge that you belong to XYZ Church. And then put an acronym on your bumper sticker on your car that you're from the VV5 Church. Oh, you know what? Get tongues. And once you get tongues, make that your badge of honor. I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. I got tongues. I got five different dialects. So I'm proud because I'm all you bragging about. When you brag about Gilgal or you brag about Bethel or you brag about the fact that you've come to Jericho, you're bragging about the place you died at. That's what denominationalism is. To denama means to number a nation. When David numbered the nation, they died. To denomination is satanic. You're bragging about where you died at. We take it up to here, and this is how we cookie cut it, and that part of the Bible we cut out, and this part we add, and this is how we do it. It's called religion, and it stinks to high hell. He says, I'm going to Jordan, the life of faith, but he said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Would you say that? So the two of them went on, because two is better than one. Because one will chase a thousand, but two will put ten thousand to flight, and two is better than one, because when they possess it together, they have a better reward. That's why marriage is still holy, and it's one of the greatest institutions on earth, second only to salvation. Salvation is first, and marriage, when you really have someone you're in one accord that you can walk and talk together and possess the land together, that's intimacy. And then 50 men of the sons of the prophets went and stood facing them at a distance while the two of them went to the Jordan. Elijah took his mantle, rolled it up, and struck the water, and it was divided this way and that so that the two of them crossed over in dry ground. Does it sound familiar? Didn't Moses? That's a miracle, friend. When water's been on ground and you go through it, it's muddy. But this is dry ground. And so it was when they had crossed over that Elijah said to Elijah, Ask, what may I do for you before I'm taken away from you? Elisha said, Please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. Now look, he's followed him 11 years. Washed his hands. Washed his feet. He served. He's now got saved. He's been in the church. He's got his denominational tag and a CC3 sticker on his car. <laughs> He's filled with the Holy Ghost. He's got the badge of tongues, five dialects. He's now crossed over the Jordan. He's possessed land. He's occupied it. He's seen signs and wonders. He's seen miracles. It's now time for the big event. And he says, ask what you will. Ask, and you'll find. Seek. It'll be open. You knock. The door will be open. Tell me what it is that you want, Elisha. Now, what you learned, you followed me all this time. He says, let a double portion of the Spirit be upon you. So he says to him, now listen, you're in phase 33. You've got all your certificates. You've done well. I anoint you and award you this award. Hey, live in bliss and live happily ever after. God bless you, Elisha. No. He says, you've asked a hard thing. You've asked a difficult thing. So Elisha says, nevertheless. Tell your neighbor, nevertheless. If you see me when I'm taken from you, it shall be for you. But if not, it shall not be. Those who endure to the end shall be saved, and the just shall live by faith. And as they happened and talked, suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind to heaven. Elisha saw it, and he cried out, My father, my father! The chariot of Israel and its horsemen, so he saw him no more. He took hold of his own clothes, tore them into pieces. He also took up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen on him. And he went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan. And he took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him, and he struck the water and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he also had struck the water, it was divided this way and that. And Elijah crossed over, and he went to the sons of prophets at Jericho. He reverses the process and goes back. 
And when he does, they say, this is the spirit of Elijah in a double portion on Elisha. He now has resurrection power. He now has glorification and ascension power. He now has intercession power. He now is in New Testament thought serving a risen Lord. And here comes the chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire. This is not the fire that he experienced in 1 Kings. This is the fire of the Holy Ghost. Where he said, set a fire. Set a fire. Redeem prayer team, if you're here, I want you to come. We need to ask the Holy Ghost for the double portion tonight. Jesus and the Holy Ghost. And ask God. To set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. Because I want more of you, God. 